Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, interesting readings, um, and I think particularly the gospel reading is, um, um, gives good cause for reflection. Um, so here we are again, Sunday morning. Wonderful. Good weather. Good worship. And thank you for your music. Good morning. I will start with our call to worship. Grace and peace to you from God. The Lord be with you. This is the day which the Lord has made. And our opening prayer, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we'll have the prayer of confession. God has promised forgiveness to all who truly repent, turn to Christ in faith, and are themselves forgiving. In silence, we call to mind our sins. Let us confess our sins. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance, we have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Saviour Christ's sake and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Through the cross of Christ, God has mercy on us. God pardons us and sets us free. So know that you are forgiven and be at peace. May God strengthen each of us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Amen. And our sentence from Psalm 130, 34. If you, O Lord, should note what we do wrong, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. And we'll say the colic together. God of infinite mercy, grant that we who know your pity may rejoice in your forgiveness and gladly forgive others for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 14, verses 9 to 31. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Israel and Egypt. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so that neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water to their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all the Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen f followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea 
and at daybreak the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The waters flowed back and covered their chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the almighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. And we'll read, we'll read Psalm 114 antiphonally. When Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his domain. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back. Mountains leapt like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it, sea, that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams, your hills like lambs? Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second reading this morning is taken from Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarrelling over the disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister, or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Praise and glory to God. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 
He began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay the master, ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow, fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Should you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers or sisters from your heart. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words spoken to us today. We ask that you may feed our hearts, feed our minds, feed our words and actions with your words. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Three very interesting and powerful readings today. I'm going to be starting off with the uh, New Testament reading. Membership to God's family is a responsibility and accountability that we should all have. We are not all on the same journey. We are not all on the same path. And God gives us talents that we need along that way. He gives us a gift that we can share with one another and help one another on that journey. Those that are probably more stronger in faith than others have more an accountability and a responsibility to share and help those who are weaker in their journey. We should have a sense of SOS. It's something that I learned this week. The S, our first S stands for sensitivity. Our second, or our O, stands for openness. And our second S is sharing. Sensitivity, openness, and sharing. That is what we as faithful servants of God should be doing. Having sensitivity for those who are on a different journey to ours and helping them when they stumble and an openness to talk to one another and share God's love and share the readings that we have in our daily lives. Sharing 
sharing to our weaker brother and sister is not a failure. It should not be an effort in our lives. It should be something that we take on and enjoy doing because that is Jesus' work at the end of the day. It is important that we assess what God has given us in doing what we need to do because that helps us to help those around us. And as God's chosen people and sharing with one another, we should clothe ourselves with righteousness, with patience, with kindness, with great love towards one another. And Paul also says that we should forgive our brothers and sisters. But not just forgive, we should forgive from our hearts. I guess at that time he was referring back to when Peter asked the question, how many times should we forgive? And Jesus didn't answer him and say, this is what you need to do. This is how you have to do it. He just says you must forgive. And I've been thinking about that for the week. Forgiving, forgiving. Why would Jesus say 77 times or this? And, and I remembered something that I was taught at school. Some of us may know it and others may not. But when we learn a word, before we use that word, we actually need to hear it in 17 different ways on average. Before we actually use that word, we would read it in text, in books, we would hear it on the radio or the television or conversation. Before we use that word 17 times on average. So Jesus says we need to forgive. We must forgive one another. Every time we think of that, that we need to forgive for that person when they have offended us, think of forgiveness. And the more you do that, the more you actually start doing it from the heart and be truly accepting in that forgiveness. Before we also forgive one another, we need to have a look at ourselves. We need to look at what we have done and sinned. And when we can it take accountability for our own actions? It also becomes easier to forgive others because when we realize where our faults are, we can help those around us. Like in the New Testament reading, the weaker can help be helped by the stronger. This past week, or last weekend, I was on conference with the Foundry Conference and our theme for the weekend was root cause analysis. Finding where the actual problems are when things happen. And we had a look, we had a guest speaker from Christchurch University, uh, Dr. Milo, well I think it was Milo Gray, and he spoke about uh, disasters that have happened in our country and abroad and one of the most common denominators between all these disasters is that somebody had changed something along the way they had changed the plan and according to the calculations that on the original plan the new plan did not meet the calculations and there were failures I'm talking about 
the very first jet airline passenger plane that was made in the UK. Uh, I'm talking about a powder plant, milk powder plant in our own country that uh, caused major problems. A silo at Fonterra milking that collapsed with uh, 500,000 litres of milk. Those are big disasters and there was a miscalculation in the new plan. How does that fall in our lives? God has a plan for us, each of us. He starts off with a master plan, yet we decide to change it along the way. We are the ones that think we can do better. We can change that plan. And when it comes time for forgiveness, we are so engrossed with our new plan that we want somebody to be accountable for what they have done to us. They want, we want them to pay something in return and then we can forgive them or we'll forgive them on conditions that that happens. That is our plan. It's not God's plan. God's plan for us, he wants us to forgive without anything happening on our side. He wants us to say, you are forgiven. And if that comes to mind again, that that particular person has faulted you, forgive them again. Because God wants you to make it a habit and use the forgiveness to help one another in our daily lives. By forgiving one another, we also can realize where we're at fault. And an analogy came to mind this week when we were assessing ourselves. When we think of something bad, we are driving those nails into Jesus' hands and feet on the cross. When we act badly towards somebody else, we are driving that spear into his side. When we speak badly of somebody, we are putting the vinegar to his mouth. That is what we are doing. Yet a man that received all of that said, I forgive you. I will forgive you and I will take that on myself. And I will be there at that judgment day when you are standing in front of God. And he will be there as our friend and as our saviour. And just to remind you how powerful God is, if we read our first reading from the Old Testament, the angel of God was in front of the army and then he went behind and then they created darkness and light that never joined. And in darkness, and you put a light there, something's going to cancel one or the other out. And it didn't. Moses defied the laws of our nature by separating the sea. And they crossed on dry land. Not wetland. They crossed on dry land. There's a riverbed or a, a floor that is soaked in water is dried and they can walk across that in dry land. However, when the army comes across, it's wet and their wheels get stuck and the wheels fall off. God just does that. And then Moses is instructed to close the waters and every single 
one that was in the army perished. That's the power of God. That's the power that we need to be afraid of. It says at the end of the reading that everybody realized how powerful God was and they feared him. And we should fear him. So if God says to us, we need to forgive one another, we need to forgive one another. And it's not just words that we look at. We're going to be singing one of my favorites later on, Amazing Grace. And it's not how in tune that we sing. No disrespect there. Um, it's how in tune we are with our heart and God when we sing those words. It's how in tune at the beginning of each service when we ask God for forgiveness for our sins that we also realize that we need to forgive those that have sinned against us. And every time we say the Lord's Prayer and we ask for forgiveness, we need to in our heart forgive those who have sinned against us. So every time we forgive, think of those 17 times that we use, need to hear a word. The more we forgive, the more we'll use it. I was going to ask us to end off again at our prayer of confession. So I'd like everybody to bow their heads and as I'm saying the words, think about it. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said. In the wrong we have done and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We also forgive those who have sinned against us. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us and forgive those who have sinned against us. For our Savior Jesus Christ's sake. And we ask that you may renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Murray, what a sermon to have to preach. That was dynamite, thank you. I don't know about anybody else here, but I found the lack of, and lack of forgiveness has come up in my life more times than I care to remember. And God has reminded me again and again that he was forgiving the people, as Murray said, who were hammering his limbs to that cross. And if he could forgive them in that situation, how can I withhold forgiveness from others? Because he did it for me and for everybody else that's ever been created. It's an enormous topic. And at the root of everything. I weep when I hear people on television who've suffered incredible traumas and things saying I can never forgive. And I think you're heading for trouble, friend. You really are. To say that we can never forgive when God forgives us is something very, very serious. And I pray for them. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you've got a red book, would you turn to page 413? 
Loving Heavenly Father, you've promised to hear when we pray. And when we pray in the name of your Son especially, therefore in confidence and trust, we pray for your church. Lord, we pray for the church that is visible. Sometimes it's man's invention and man's fabrication. But Lord, your church is growing across the globe. And we thank you that none can stop against, stop your spirit working. We thank you for the growth of the church in countries which are where to be a Christian means persecution. And in many, many cases means death. Lord, we pray that you'll strengthen them. Hold them close to yourself, Lord. And may they know your love and your peace even in the traumas that they face. We have it easy here in many ways. And Lord, we take things lightly. So Lord, help us to realize the situation that you will be triumphant one day, that you will rule this world, and that we are the example of your faith and your love and your trust. So may we be faithful representatives of your person and of your kingdom. That's what we're called to be. Lord, help us to realize the situation. Lord, wake us up to the issues that we face. Not just negative issues, but wake us up to the fact that you have called us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So, Lord, we pray that we may be that salt of the earth and light to the world. Lord, liven us, wake us up. Half as we're often quite half dead. Lord, breathe life, fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. And Lord, that may be doing some funny things sometimes. It may be, as Murray said, relating to people and forgiving people. And Lord, going out of our comfort zone frequently, if my life's any example to go by. So Lord, may we trust you because you give everything we need for every situation you put us in. Lord, we pray too for the world in the most almighty mess because we thought we knew better than you did in how to run it. So Lord, we think of all the traumas that there is going on at the moment. Floods in Libya, no, not Libya, sorry, floods in Greece. Terrible troubles in Libya. Lord, the earthquake, I think that was Turkey or Abyssinia. And Lord, I get go muddled with all the countries. We pray for this world which is so traumatized at the moment. We think of people who've lost absolutely everything that they ever had and lost half their families too in many cases or all their families. Lord, we pray for that world. The world you love, the world that you want to sort out, the world that is your world. You created it and we messed it up. So Lord, forgive us for that. And we pray for those who are seeking to help and bring to peace and harmony and to rescue people at the cost of their own lives often. Lord, we think of the wars that are going on. We think of the endless war in Ukraine, which is affecting more than just Ukraine. We pray for the Russians who've been forced into conscription to go and fight the Ukrainians who they don't even have anything against. Lord, we take the news so lightly because we get almost numb with what's coming on the television. So Lord, we pray for those and we pray for the people who have indeed given their lives to try and help the Ukrainians in this senseless war that's going on over there. So Lord, have mercy on us. And Lord, lead us and everyone into ways of justice and peace that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. And Lord, help us to see, too, how wonderful the world is. We go and 
go on holiday maybe and see wonderful things and think of it. But we don't really see quite often who's behind it all and how you made it for us and how even in its spoiled state it is really beautiful and amazing. And as the scientists discover week by week and day by day and month by month all these new things they can do because the body is made so in intricately and the wonders. Lord, may we be ones who teach, teach us, how you've taught us to care creatively for the resources that are there. We pray too for our community. Lord, the community of New Zealand is in a bit of a mess at the moment, to put it mildly. We're getting ram raids and burglaries and murders. Lord, they seem to be senseless and endless. And we think of the latest one. And we think of the people who are trying to make a living and whose livings are being destroyed by the selfishness and greed of others. Lord, we pray for the police that you will give them the wisdom and the ability to get to the bottom of some of these things. Lord, inspire us with your wisdom and may the decisions of the others of people who affect us, may they act with integrity and courage. Lord, we think of our families too. Families that are fractured, families as a whole. We thank you for everything, all family, Lord. And we pray for those who are seeking to restore damaged families. Give grace to those whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. And forgive too, Lord, after that sermon. Lord, we pray for those in need. Well, there's all the people whose lives are being damaged by the burglaries and crime raids and things. We pray for the sickness. Lord, sickness seems to be on the rise and medical help seems to be on the way down. Lord, you can sort that one out. We trust you to do so. Lord, we pray for those who have got no ability to reach any sort of medical help for some reason. We pray for them. Lord, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind and spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. For Lord, you are indeed the healer over and above anybody that we can see or consult. And Lord, make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we spare in making people whole. And Lord, that's our responsibility. Lord, we think of people too who have died. Some of them known to us, others not known to us. We know what it is, some, well, quite a few of us know what it is to be grieving for loss of people. Lord, we thank you for those who we know have died in the faith of Christ, but we leave with you those whose faith is known to you alone, and we don't speculate, Lord. Father, into your hands we commend them. Lord, give comfort to the people who mourn. May they know that you understand and that you are with them. Bring them peace in their time of loss. And we thank you for those that we know who've gone to be with you and who are now free from all the traumas that we seem to live with. May their example inspire and encourage us. And would you turn to page 417, please, and read the third prayer there. Now to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or conceive, by the power which is at work among us, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Amen.